purchase IUL the right way, the way it was intended to maximize rates of return. In other words, when uh, Universal Life and later Index Universal Life came out, uh, EF Hutton was the brainchild. They designed it to be able to be used for living benefits, not just a death benefit. Let me show you what that means and why this knocks the socks off of most investments like IRAs and 401ks invested in the market. So I'm Doug Andrew. I've been uh, a financial strategist and retirement planning specialist now for five decades, helping people optimize their assets, minimize taxes, and uh, empower what I call their authentic wealth. And my favorite financial vehicle to help them achieve uh, financial independence and not outlive their money, to make themselves immune from taxes, inflation, and market volatility and that causes most retirees to outlive their money. My favorite vehicle is a property structured max funded indexed universal life. When it's structured correctly and funded properly, it is deemed a laser fund. Uh, laser is an acronym that stands for liquid asset safely earning returns. It's the title of my most recent best-selling book that's been flying off of our warehouse shelves. Um, it retails for 20 bucks on Amazon, but stay with me until the end of this episode. I'll gift you a copy free, okay? So what do I mean by structuring it correctly? Okay, basically, uh, when you study my book, and uh, if you're an advisor, you need to understand and learn this, or you're doing your clients a disservice. First of all, uh, when it was first created uh, by E.F. Hutton, they realized under three sections of the Internal Revenue Code, now for over 108 years, uh, there's basically only one financial vehicle uh, that I'm aware of, and I've asked many CPAs and tax attorneys to show me any other financial vehicle that does this, allows you to accumulate your money tax-free. And that's under Section 72E of the Internal Revenue Code inside of an insurance contract. Section 7702 allows you to access that money while you're alive without triggering taxes on your gains, okay? Uh, so that you can generate tax-free income, a million dollars in an insurance policy can generate 100,000 a year of tax-free income uh, until you're age 120 without depleting principal. That is tax-free because of section 7702. Section 101A means at the end of the day when you pass away, anything you leave behind in there blossoms, increases in, values, uh, uh, in value and transfers income tax-free. Uh, nothing else does that in the Internal Revenue Code, but it's all because it's a sacred tax-free cash cow, so to speak, uh, because you're taking pressure off of the government to take care of you if you die uh, sooner. It takes care of your widows and orphans. If you live longer, it keeps you going and it takes pressure off the government uh, having to provide, you know, welfare benefits or whatever. So it's, it's tax-free. Now, <clears throat> E.F. Hutton realized that and so they introduced it back in 1980. And then there was this massive exodus of money that was leaving the banks, the brokerage firms into these because these were safer. They paid higher interest. They were tax-free. And all E.F. Hutton said was, well, we're taking the least amount of insurance. The IRS will let us get away with it. We're putting in the most money premium. The IRS allows as fast as they allow. And this turns into a tax-free cash cow as a living benefit. Well, they uh, uh, went through some lawsuits because the IRS thought they were overstepping their bounds, so they sued them. Uh, E.F. Hutton wasn't doing anything wrong. And so then uh, the IRS went to Congress and said, we've got to change the definition of tax-free under these three sections of the code. We think you're violating the def definition of insurance. Uh, you're moving over to a different section of the code, investments, and investments are taxable. So uh, this is not an investment. I don't want it to be deemed an investment because those are taxable sooner or later. And usually it means you're subject to market volatility. And so in a nutshell, in 1982, under the Tax Equity Fiscal Responsibility Act, it spells the acronym TEFRA. And then two years later, under the Deficit Reduction Act, it created this corridor, uh, TEFRA and DEFRA, that dictates the minimum amount of insurance uh, that you must attach to the account based upon the insured's age gender and health. And the more uh, unhealthy they are, or the older they are, the less insurance that's required. So it gave parity. So it didn't matter if you were uh, 65 or uh, 78, like one of the friends of our family had adult onset diabetes, a prostate cancer episode, and three blocked arteries, six sisters predeceased him and three brothers. Uh, he was able to get 11% uh, and net 10%, just like a 22-year-old athletic marathon running female 
The cost of insurance was the same at age 78, even though he was rated table D because we got away with less insurance for him. TEFRA and DEFRA allows you to squeeze down the death benefit if your objective is rate of return. Now, in 1988, under the Technical and Miscellaneous Revenue Act, um, you know, the banks and the brokerage firms, they couldn't compete. These were safer. They paid higher interest. They were tax-free. They blossomed when you died. They couldn't compete. So they lobbied Congress not to get rid of them because this is where they put their tier one assets for liquidity and safety. But they just wanted to slow the flow of money leaving their institutions over to this. And so in uh, 1988, June 21st to be exact, they passed the, the TAMRA tax citation. And that has to do with section 7702, uh, that if you uh, fund it too fast, then uh, it'll still grow tax deferred. Uh, if you die, it, it blossoms and transfers tax-free under this section. But if you wanna create tax-free income under 7702, it'll be taxable unless you comply with TAMRA. So I, I explained this by using a metaphor of a bucket. If a bucket was uh, uh, metaphorically an IUL policy, then uh, what I'm doing is I'm meeting with a client. If that client is a male age 60, let's say, and they want to reposition $500,000 of their assets to increase liquidity, safety, and the rate of return of the tax benefits. Uh, so they come to me to do that. Well, <clears throat> I could buy a, a ton of life insurance for them for 500,000, but that's not the objective. I'm not trying to maximize what I leave behind when I die. I want to maximize the rate of return so that 500,000 can generate a 10% payout of 50 grand a year, or let it grow to a million and it generates 100,000 a year, let it grow to 2 million and it can generate 200,000 a year, a 10% payout uh, tax-free without depleting principal. So you do that by taking the least amount of insurance the IRS will let, let you get away with under TEFRA and DEFRA. That would be a, about a million, okay? And uh, then you fill it up as fast as TAMRA allows. Now, Index Universal Life uh, allows you to get away with less insurance than whole life. And so the spigot on the bucket, the actual cost of insurance, is cheaper with uh, uh, Index Universal Life than with whole life. And it takes seven years to get the money in with whole life. It only takes five years or actually four years in one day. I can put in a hundred grand a year, so to speak, for uh, at, the, at the beginning of every year. So in four years and one day into the fifth year, I've, I've got my 500,000 in there. But my 500,000 now uh, qualifies as part of the death benefit. The, the net amount of risk is now only the remaining 500,000. So the insurance company is only charging me after four years and one day for half as much death benefit as they charged me for at the beginning. I'm becoming self-insured. Uh, at my average rates of return exceeding over 9.6%, this will double in seven and a half years, 500,000 will grow to a million. Now, I am self-insured. My cash value equals the death benefit. There is no cost for the insurance, but if I happen to die, Tefra and Defra says the insurance company will pay out 5% more, a million 50,000 if I die. But they're only charging you for 50,000 of insurance, even though you're you know, uh, 11 years older, they're only charging you uh, for 50,000 of net amount at risk, the interest on your million dwarfs the cost of insurance for 50,000. If, if the million doubles in another seven and a half years to 2 million, the interest on 2 million is way more than the cost of insurance for 100,000 net amount at risk. Because if you died, they'd leave behind 2.1 million. Is that making sense? You can't believe how many uh, agents don't understand what I just said. So you're using it for a living benefit. This is the way it was intended. Now, when you use indexing, then it gives you the opportunity to earn a rate of return better than the general account portfolio rate in the insurance company. And now, back in the 1980s, I never earned less than 11 and three quarters percent from 1980 to 1990 and as high as 15 and But in the 90s, interest rates started to come down and indexing came out. And this is an incredible opportunity because let's say I have a million of cash value. Uh, let's just use a snapshot in time. You can extrapolate from this. Uh, at a million dollar cash value, let's say the general account portfolio during uh, the Great Recession was only four or 5%, which is about what it was. If I feel bearish about America, I can just settle for 4% or 40 grand of interest on my million that year, which is way more than banks were paying. Uh, so I end up with a million 40,000 at the end of the year and it's tax free. But if I feel bullish about America, then what I can do is I can tell the insurance company, hey, I will relinquish the interest 
that you're crediting me on my million, that 40,000, and you can have that 40,000 of interest uh, to fund an options budget, to be able to purchase upside options in the index or indices that I choose that you're offering. Let's say I choose the S&P 500, but I could choose the Russell 2000, the Dow Jones, I could diversify among all of them. Let's just keep it simple. Let's say it's the S&P. So if the S&P goes up 8%, they pay me 80 grand on my million. How do they do that? Because 40,000 of options doubled to 80,000 or even 120,000, 12%, maybe up to a cap. But if the market tanks, I don't lose one dime of my million, okay? I just gave up the interest on my million that year. I earned zero, but zero was my hero because most Americans who had a uh, million dollars in 2008 at the end of that year only had 600,000 to show for it with their money in a S&P 500 index fund. This isn't the S&P 500 index mutual fund. This is indexing linking to the S&P 500. So I still have my million. I, I, I may not make anything, but I don't lose, okay? So uh, in my book that I wanna gift you here, a million, it funds an option budget and that, that allows the insurance company to pay you if the market gains, but you don't lose if, uh, because uh, the, the remaining 960,000 with 4% interest is growing back to the million. And so you're back to break even again. You didn't make anything, but you didn't lose, okay? And Will Rogers once said, people get more concerned about the return of their money instead of the return on their money when things get bad. So uh, when people say, well, how does indexing uh, work when you diversify? Because what I teach in this book is you've got to diversify and rebalance, okay? So I'm gonna super simplify this. Uh, many times during uh, typical periods, uh, studies have shown that in any 20 year period since the Great Depression, if you allocated 40% to a one year uh, point to point, in a high cap index, 40% to a two year and 20% to a five year, you will average 11.3%. And people say, Doug, you claim you've, you've averaged 11.17. How? I just showed you, okay? Now, uh, when there's anxiety, there's opportunity. Why do I do this? Cresmont Research said, you take any 50 year period since the Great Depression, if you eliminated 100% of the loss years, okay? You didn't earn anything, but you didn't make anything you would only need 25% of the gain years to outperform the market. I can do way better than that. Uh, when the market uh, drops down, uh, then sometimes I'll say, hey, let's put 50% in a two year, 50% on five year, because the average is 14% when you do that. That's what we do. I'm gonna show you some actual examples of, of what I mean by rebalancing. But see, this is a typical statement where we diversify into five different uh, indexing strategies when you do it the way it's, it's designed. Okay, 14.89, 16.5, 10.25, 15.07, 13%. Pretty good average rates of return by diversifying among five. You diversify among superior alternatives, okay? Tax-free. Now, <clears throat> sometimes people hear me on my YouTube channel say, well, uh, during downturns, uh, some of our clients locked in gains of 61.33% when inflation was 15, because I always have been able to outpace inflation. Where do you earn 61.33%? Well, actually, some of our clients got credited 158% from March of 2020 to March of 2021. How? First of all, <clears throat> you see the market go down like it did 30% in March of 2020. And my sons called their clients and said, hey, you may want to link to a one year point to point with no cap. We usually don't recommend that, why? Because uh, the insurance company will, will subtract five percentage points off your rate of return because of the, you know, the price of options and so forth. So if you earn 12, you're only gonna net seven. We normally don't do that. but. Hey, when there's anxiety, there's opportunity. So when the market dropped 30%, they said link to a one year point to point with no cap. The market in March of 2021, a year later, was up 66.33%. Subtract five percentage points off of that. They netted 61.33. This client wish he would have allocated all of his money. He allocated half of it. The other half, he, he put in three different ones and you know, he got nine and 12 and 7.25. And on, on this 18,000, he got credited 61.33. He made 11,500. 
his account uh, that, that went from 18,000 up to 29,000. Uh, my son had a client that had over $8 million in his uh, index universal life. Uh, in March of 2020, he linked 852,000 of that to a one year point to point with no cap. Okay, I'll try that. He got credited 61.33 on that. That's 535 grand. 852,000 uh, at the end of the year was worth 1,387,000. This is a real statement, okay? Uh, yeah, this happens. This is the real world. And so uh, when you do uh, it the right way, so many critics will go, oh, show me an IUL that has ever uh, outperformed the original illustrations from 10 years or more earlier. Okay. So we, cre we created some uh, different YouTube videos showing this uh, on our channel. When structured correctly and funded properly, which is what I'm talking about, it often outperforms the illustrated projections from 10, 15 years earlier. So for example, uh, this particular person had uh, an average of 12.88% rates of return since he began this policy. Now that's way more than we projected. We projected like eight or nine, okay? Uh, he ended up with 110,000 at the end of this year. We, on his original illustration, when he took it out, uh, we projected he would only have 63,000. We projected 63 and he ended up with 110. There you go, uh, naysayers, and there's the proof. Uh, sometimes it's not that dramatic. Here's, here's a one that averaged 9.56, and I think we illustrated eight and a half or nine when he took it out. He ended up with 70,000, and uh, it was projected he would only have 63,000, okay? The point is this, when it's structured correctly and funded properly, it's designed to do what it was intended to do, and that's to maximize rates of return, so that if you accumulate a million bucks, it can generate 100,000 a year of tax-free income. So what do I want you to do? I want you to study how to do this. If you're a consumer and you wanna make sure it's done right for you, claim a free copy of my book. If you're an advisor, you need to learn how to do this right or you're, you're not doing your clients a service. You need to become a certified IUL professional to understand how to do what I just said. So it all begins with uh, studying my book, uh, The Laser Fund. This is 300 pages, jam-packed with information. It retails on Amazon for 20 bucks if you go there and buy it, thank you, but I'll gift it to you free. Uh, this is actually two books in one. This white covered side is for the left brain learners. If you learn by charts and graphs and, uh, and percentages, uh, study this one. If you learn by, more by stories and examples, you flip over to this one. This is about 100 pages. 12 chapters with 62 actual client stories. If you wanna learn uh, with both your left and right brain, read both of these books. But uh, you simply go to laserfund.com or click on the link below. You contribute a nominal amount towards the shipping and handling. I require some skin in the game. And I'll cover the rest of that if there's a deficit there and uh, I'll pay for the book. Now, <clears throat> I'll fire out a hard copy to you via priority mail. While you're in there claiming your free copy, if you like to listen and learn or watch and learn, there's uh, those formats available. Um, <clears throat> we teach educational webinars uh, on a weekly basis, they're free. But you can schedule an appointment to talk to an IUL specialist with no cost or obligation right there. And these are specialists that are, that are IUL certified professionals that I oversee. They had to pass a very complicated exam with 100%, not 80%, not 90%, 100% before they got certified. And if you wanna to talk to one of them, which I would recommend, uh, then uh, schedule an appointment and we'll get back to you. This is not about me, this is about you and your brighter future. So uh, click on the link below and uh, we'll see you on the other side of your brighter future.